All right, let's begin our study of the Gospel of Mark. I'm going to be teaching this class along with Brett Russell and Jordan Tanner. And um, we're going to just pick some selections through this gospel account and think about how we can be more like Jesus. But this morning, especially, I'm going to be introducing the book. I'm going to kind of hurry through the first part of your outline. There are handouts out in the uh, foyer if you didn't get one. I'm going to kind of hurry through the first part of the outline, and we're just going to spend the last part of our class this morning talking about who Jesus is and how he's presented in the gospel of Mark. So if I seem to be going kind of fast at the beginning, just jot down the scripture references. Don't try to write everything that's on the screen. That would be my Advice, and, uh, and we're going to move with a little bit of a, a tempo here. All right. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the four gospel accounts. And when you look at how each one begins, Matthew begins the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But when you turn over to Luke, you'll find that Luke says many have undertaken to compile a narrative. And then when you look at the gospel of John, John talks about the being the testimony of and when people have talked about the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Ma uh, Matthew wrote a book, Luke wrote a narrative, John wrote a testimony, many witnesses being called to the stand to tell about who Jesus is. But Mark, in Mark chapter 1, verse 1, Mark wrote a gospel. And the word gospel means good news. And so the, the first uh, line of the book of Mark, it's not even a complete sentence, interestingly enough. It just says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. There's really no verb there. It just, that's how the gospel begins. So Matthew wrote a book, Luke wrote, wrote a narrative, John wrote a testimony, Mark wrote a gospel. It's good news that Mark is telling us about. And not only that, but the, the word gospel in the book of Mark, okay, 16 chapters in the book of Mark, but the word gospel becomes a really important word in this, in this book. For example, just showing you some passages, Mark 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but then later in the, in the book of Mark in chapter 1 verses 14 and 15, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee and Jesus began to proclaim the gospel of God. And he said, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. The word gospel means good news. And over and over in Mark, we find this word being brought to our attention. You need to think about Jesus and the good news that's found in him. Mark 8, 35, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Mark's all about the good news. Mark 10, 29, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel. Again, there's a message, there's, there's a um, there's a body of truth that's been delivered to us. It's the good news and it comes through Jesus. He's the one who preaches the gospel, but he's also the one who in himself is the gospel. And Mark is telling you there's good news when you look to Jesus and when you listen to his words and when you watch who he is and how he acts and how he behaves. Again, Mark 13, 10, the gospel must first be proclaimed to all the nations and again, Mark 14, verse 9, truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And then the very end of the gospel of Mark, Mark 16, verse 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, preach the gospel to every creature, to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Whoever does not believe will be condemned. I bring this to your attention because Mark is an account that's trying to convince you that there is good news in Jesus Christ, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, in Mark 1 verse 1, back at the very first verse where it says the beginning of the gospel, some have taken that expression and said, really what Mark did in these 16 chapters would just tell you the beginning. And there's some truth to that. There's more to the gospel than just the life and the teachings and the death of Jesus. The gospel also has to do with the resurrection of Jesus and then the preaching of the implications of that death, burial, and resurrection for us. And so when Mark calls his book the beginning of the gospel, this is what you need. This is the foundation upon which you can come to Jesus and can know him. And when you get to Acts chapter 2, you find the gospel being spelled out. Repent and be baptized, just as Jesus had prophesied in Mark 16. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. So the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Mark is. Questions, comments thus far?
Okay, now, why do we call it Mark? You know, it's, it's uh, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The books of the Bible are very often named for who we believe the author of that book is. And when we read this particular book of, of Scripture, it was written by a man named Mark. Actually, his name was John Mark. And I'm just going to give you some passages to kind of survey his life briefly, okay? Who is John Mark, the man that's writing this gospel? By the way, he's not an apostle. He's not one of the 12, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Mark's not in that list. Um, so who is this man, John Mark? One of the things we know about John Mark is that his mother had a house in Jerusalem. Acts 12, verse 12, Peter uh, went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Mary was John's mother, John Mark's mother. And she had a large house, and that leads many scholars to understand that Mark must have been from a wealthier family. She had a large house in Jerusalem. The whole church in Jerusalem was able to come together and to pray for Peter after he'd been arrested. And, uh, and so Mary, John Mark's mother, she lives in Jerusalem, and that presumably would have been where John Mark grew up. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, in the book of Mark, there's this, there's this curious thing that happens. When Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, just two verses, and they're only found in Mark's Gospel. In Mark 14, 51 and 52, Mark writes, a young man followed Jesus with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. And it's just, uh, it's a really strange couple of verses that are there. And the reason why they're there very likely is because Mark is writing about what happened to him. He was there in the garden. He was there with the apostles and with Jesus, evidently, when uh, Jesus was arrested and he fled. And he was so desperate to get away from those who would arrest Jesus that he fled naked. He fled without his clothing. Um, again, when you think about who John Mark was famously, John Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on uh, their first missionary journey. And he was a cousin of, Mark, uh, of, of Barnabas. John Mark was a cousin of Barnabas. So he's, he's connected in lots of different ways to people that we're more familiar with in the New Testament. Uh, so Paul writes in Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if Mark comes to you, welcome him. So Mark is Barnabas' cousin. Mark is the son of a lady named Mary who lives in Jerusalem. Mark is probably the young man who flees naked in the Garden of Gethsemane there. And, uh, and then at the end of his, um, uh, you know, the writings about him, in 1 Peter 5, 13, Peter writes, as he's writing the book of 1 Peter, she who is at Babylon is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark. And Peter calls Mark my son. That does not mean that Mark is... Peter's literal son, but as you know, Paul and Peter and other apostles, oftentimes when they would work closely with a young man, they would call them my son in the faith, my true child in the faith. Paul spoke about Timothy and Titus that way, for example. And so it appears from this passage that Peter and Mark were very close. So Mark is a cousin of Barnabas. Mark is a close co-worker with Peter. And as I mentioned a moment ago, Mark is also the one who went with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Acts 13, 5, when they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the Lord in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John, that's John Mark, to assist them. So Paul and Barnabas went off on the first missionary journey. They began to preach the gospel in places where it had never gone before. And John Mark, this young man who's Barnabas' cousin, who was there evidently in the Garden of Gethsemane, John Mark goes with them and is preaching with them. But what happened to John Mark? I'm asking you, audience response now. What happened to John Mark on this first missionary journey that really frustrated Paul apparently? Yeah. So, later on in Acts 13, John Mark turned back. It does not say why he turned back, but it says in Acts 13, verse 13, Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John left them and returned to Jerusalem. And the implication, especially when you get to Acts 15 in just a moment, this was a disappointment for Paul and for Barnabas as well. Um, whether John got homesick or John Mark got homesick or whether he um, uh, 
whether he uh, was, was worried about the persecution that they were likely going to begin to endure in preaching the gospel. Um, nobody knows why he turned back. The Bible doesn't tell us. It just says he turned back. He started out on this commitment and he did not see it through to the end. And so when you're reading the gospel of Mark and you're reading these 16 chapters, it's important to kind of know a little bit about the author and his background and who he is. Um, in Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas want to go on a second missionary journey together. But it says in Acts 15, 37, Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. It's my cousin after all. John, John Mark can do a lot of good for us. But Paul thought it best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And, verse 39, there arose a sharp disagreement so that Paul and Barnabas separated from each other. And so Barnabas ended up taking Mark and going to Cyprus. Cyprus was where Barnabas was from. It may be well where John Mark's ancestors were from. Maybe he's got family there. Obviously, his mother has a house in Jerusalem, according to Acts 12. But perhaps John Mark had grown up in Cyprus. Whatever the case... There's a sharp disagreement and Paul says, John Mark deserted us. He let, let us down when he was on that missionary journey with us. And I don't want to give him another chance because the work is too important. And Barnabas is saying on the other hand, yes, but it's important to give people second chances. It's important to believe in people, even when they've disappointed us. And so Paul and Barnabas can't see eye to eye on this. They choose not to work together. And Barnabas takes Mark and they go to Cyprus. And Mark ends up doing a great work. Um, in fact, later in Paul's life, even though Paul did not want to work with Mark on this occasion, later in Paul's life in Philemon 23 and 24, he calls Mark one of my fellow workers. And not only that, but the Bible also says in 2 Timothy 4.11, Luke alone is with me. This is Paul writing, get Mark and bring him with you, Timothy, for he is very useful to me for ministry. And so even the Apostle Paul came later to say, you know, John Mark may have disappointed me when he turned back, but he's continued and he's proved himself as a faithful servant of Jesus Christ and he's useful to me in ministry. I still want to work with him. Interesting things to think about when you talk about who John Mark was and the kind of life that he lived. A lot that you could string together in those passages just to kind of see a picture of a man who Yes, he failed. Yes, he did some things that, um, that, that he would have said, I, I myself am ashamed of having done these things. But there's forgiveness and there's grace and there is renewed opportunity while we have the Lord in our lives. And therefore, that's what John Mark found. Questions or thoughts? Like I said, I know I'm going kind of quickly with some of this. Okay. All right. So kind of summing up who was John Mark um, very quickly. John Mark probably wrote the book of Mark between A.D. 56 and 63. Um, the book of Mark is probably, not, not 100% certain, but probably the very first gospel account written. So probably it came before Matthew and Luke and John. And by the way, when you think about that, Jesus died and was buried and was raised in A.D. 30 to 33, depending on what calendar you're using, okay? It's interesting to consider that there was a 20 plus year time gap between the life of Christ and the first gospel account. Have you ever stopped to think about that? So Jesus died, was buried and rose again and the apostles and others went around preaching the resurrection of Jesus, preaching that we ought to put our faith in him, we ought to repent and be baptized. But it wasn't until about 20 years after that Mark and Luke and John and Matthew sat down and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit wrote a gospel account. It wasn't until about 20 years later. It, what was happening in the interim God was giving the information directly to his people, miraculously. God was giving the miraculous gift of knowledge and prophecy to the church. And that's what miracles were. They were, they were gifts from God intended to enrich and to bless the church. And so for 20 years, everywhere people went, they preached Jesus, but they preached not by opening the book of Mark, because it wasn't written yet. They preached by just saying, 
open to the book of Isaiah, they would say, or open to the book of Psalms, and I'm going to tell you about Jesus that God sent into the world. And that was the way they would preach Jesus. So, about 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, Mark writes, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Gospel of Mark. Um, Mark also works closely with Peter later in Peter's life, 1 Peter 5, verse 13. As we've noted, Peter goes into far places. Uh, he calls himself one in Babylon, and, um, and Mark is with Peter, and he calls him my son, 1 Peter 5, 13. According to secular history, tradition, John Mark died in Alexandria, Egypt. There was a big Jewish population in Alexandria, by the way. Uh, he died in Alexandria, Egypt in AD 64. So before the, the city of Jerusalem was destroyed, um, any of those kinds of events took place. Uh, secular history says that's when Mark died. So that's kind of who our author is as we read the Gospel of Mark. Okay, 16 chapters in the book and it's a really fast paced book. It's one that uh, is written probably to a Roman audience um, of Gentiles, all those things. But this is the man who penned that book. Questions? Moving right along then, okay. What are some of the key features of the gospel of Mark? Some of the key things, as you look at the book of Mark, this is usually, if you go to a foreign country where the, where the Bible has not yet been translated, and there still are countries, there are languages in the world where they don't have access to a Bible in their own language. There's still places like that in the world. But missionaries that go into foreign countries and end up translating the Bible into a new language that's not been translated before, almost universally start with the Gospel of Mark. Almost universally. It is a gospel. It is good news. And it tells you the facts very quickly about who Jesus is. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago, the book of Mark is probably written to a Gentile audience. People who did not know some of the customs and some of the language that the Jews would have used. One of the ways we know that this is probably written to Gentiles is because throughout the Gospel of Mark, you have Mark explaining things to his audience. And if you kind of read it, you know, through that lens, uh, Mark 7, 3 and 4, Mark puts in parentheses, the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. He doesn't have to tell that if he's writing to a Jewish audience. The Jews know that. But the Romans wouldn't have. I mean, it's a custom that the Jews have. And we're not familiar with that. So Mark takes time to explain that. Not only that, but Mark translates Aramaic expressions. They spoke Aramaic in Jesus' day in Israel. Hebrew, Aramaic, they're, they're closely related languages, but not exactly the same. And so Mark frequently translates Aramaic into Greek for his readers. So Mark 3.17, Jesus called James and John, the apostles, Boanerges. And Mark tells you that means sons of thunder. It's an Aramaic word, and you need to, be, you need to know what the translation is so that you'll understand the meaning. Mark 5.41, Jesus speaks to Jairus' daughter. She's dead. And he says, Talitha Kumai, he speaks in Aramaic. And Mark translates that for his audience. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Again, Mark 7, verse 11, the word Corban. You and I probably know what Corban means because we've heard these accounts all our lives. But Corban is a Jewish word. It means given to God or a gift to God. And so Mark is translating these words for his audience, implying to us that he's not writing to a Jewish audience because you wouldn't have had to translate the words otherwise. He understands that his audience is Gentile. They are probably Romans. Um, incidentally, I didn't put this on the slide, but Mark, when he talks about time, he uses Roman time, not Jewish time. They had two different clocks and two different calendars. The Jewish calendar, the Jewish clock, the Roman calendar, the Roman clock. When Mark gives you time references, uh, he speaks about Roman time. Okay, Roman reckoning of time. And so one of the things that we know about Mark is it's probably written to a Gentile audience, perhaps a Roman Gentile audience. Okay. Um, by the way, questions about that just yet? Comments? Okay. Okay. 
Um, what else? The emphasis of Mark is on the actions of Jesus. One of the reasons why this is probably the first book that missionaries translate into other languages, it tells you so much about Jesus in such a brief span um, without need for a great deal of further explanation. It just tells you this is who Jesus is. This is the emphasis on what he did, the kind of man that he is, the kind of savior that he would be. There are 19 miracles recorded in Mark and there are only four parables. Okay, it kind of gives you a, a picture of the contrast. Parables are important. What Jesus said is important, but you've got to turn to Matthew, Luke to look at the parables of Jesus in any kind of depth. The miracles of Jesus are what are on display. The actions of Jesus, the way that he dealt with people and related to people, those are the things that Mark deals with. Again, the key verse of Mark in my estimation is Mark seven thirty seven. Key verse, whole book. The Bible says they were astonished beyond measure saying about Jesus, he has done all things well. He makes even the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. When we think about who Jesus is, he's done all things well. That's what Mark is all about. The actions of Jesus, the way he lived, the kind of example that he set, the kind of interactions he had with people. Some key features of the book of Mark. It is, as we've mentioned, an early gospel probably the first one written, okay? Probably written before Luke, probably written before Matthew, probably written before John. So it's an early gospel account. Um, incidentally, when you look at the testimony that Mark gives, there's a lot of details that maybe don't come out in some of, you know, in Matthew and Luke, but um, all but 31 of the verses that Mark gives us are given parallel references in Matthew or Luke, okay? All but 31 verses in this book um, are, I have a parallel reference in either Matthew or Luke or both. Incidentally, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you might hear people use the term synoptic gospels. Have you ever heard that word before? S-Y-N-O-P-T I see, I think that's right. Synoptic, um, it's early. Synoptic gospels, but synoptic means seen together. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they share a great number of similarities. And so, again, a um, lot of the data, a lot of the information that, give, that, we're, that we receive from Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke give us some of that same information with maybe a little bit different perspective, uh, given for a little bit different reason, okay? But probably the first one written. It is a concise gospel. Out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Mark is by far the shortest. There are only 661 verses in Mark, only 16 chapters in Mark. By contrast, Luke, which is the longest gospel account, has 1,151 verses. Okay, so Luke is a lot longer, almost twice as long as Mark. Matthew has 1,071 and John has 879 verses. Okay, you could read the entire book of Mark, all 16 chapters in about an hour and a half. If you're reading at an average pace, about an hour and a half. Okay, it's concise. It is fast paced. If you've studied Mark before, you'll recognize the word immediately. Or if you've got the King James translation, the word straightway, immediately, fast paced. Mark uses that word 40 times in this gospel account, immediately, immediately, immediately. And then not only that, but it's not on the screen, two thirds of the verses in Mark begin with the word and. And so it's like a little kid telling a story to his mom and he's run on sentence, but he just says, and, 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 because he's excited. Mark is excited to tell this story. And so as he speaks to us, uh, writes to us, so many of the verses begin in the Greek language with the word and, okay? It's fast paced. There's, there's a, a rapidity to it. It is a vivid gospel account. There are details in this gospel that are not found in others. Lively, lively little touches. Um, there's, there's some things that are very distinctive and very graphic that are given in Mark that prove to us that many of the things Mark writes about, he himself was an eyewitness to. Um, Mark is the account, for example, that tells us when Jesus deals with the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, Mark's the only one that tells us that Jesus, looking at the rich young ruler, loved him tells us why Jesus said what he said to the rich young rulers, because he loved him, he cared about him. Um, little details like that, not found in the other gospel accounts. 
And then finally, Mark is an evangelistic gospel. The word gospel is found in Mark 1 verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then Mark 16, 15, at the end of the book, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So it's about evangelism. It's about reaching people. It's about sharing the message, the good news about Jesus with the world. That's a survey of who Mark is and some of the key features of the gospel of Mark. Any questions? Any comments? Okay. Here's what we're going to do with the rest of our study. Open your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, and we're just going to talk about how Mark presents Jesus to us. You might have heard me use this outline before. That's all right. You need to hear it again. We need to think about what Jesus is really like. We need to think about who Jesus is. And when you look at Mark, there are 16 chapters in Mark and there are 16 portraits of Jesus that are given to us in this gospel account. And so if you're looking at Mark chapter one, who is Jesus? When Mark tells us about who Jesus is, and again, this is inspired, this comes down from God. Mark writes about Jesus to us, but he shows us pictures of a savior that is real and who is a historical uh, figure and who we can put our faith and our trust in. So what is Jesus really like? Look at Mark one, verse 35. In Mark one, verse 35, Jesus is a man of prayer. He had been healing all night, late into the night, the Bible tells us. But then Mark 1.35 says, arising a good while before dawn, he departed into a private place and there he prayed. Early in his morning, Jesus by himself went alone to a place of prayer. We are least like Jesus in our prayer lives. Jesus, the son of God came to this world and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. And if he needed that kind of strength and that kind of comfort from his heavenly father, if he needed that kind of focus, how much more do we as followers of Jesus Christ? So who is Jesus? He's a man of prayer, someone who prayed. Not only that, but when you turn to Mark chapter two, look at verse 17. The Pharisees asked, why does Jesus eat with sinners and tax collectors? And Jesus is a man of unfailing logic. He wasn't just doing things in his life and his ministry haphazardly, ad hoc. Jesus was constantly logical about how he did things, why he did things the way they they were done. And he says to the Pharisees in Mark 2, 17, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. We need to be logical in why and how we engage in ministry. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be discerning. Jesus certainly was. And when Jesus looked at his ministry and his opportunities before him, Jesus always used logic. Who do I need to teach? Who do I need to spend time with? Certainly not the Pharisees. Why not? They don't think they need me. They don't think that I can offer anything to them. So where's Jesus going to spend his time? He's going to spend his time with those who think they need him. We need to think with discernment about our ministry. Mark 2, 17. He's a man of logic. Jesus used unfailing logic in the way he reasoned about the scriptures. When people came to Jesus with questions about this matter of doctrine or that matter of the law, Jesus always very logically answered, have you not read what is written? Or go and learn what this means. It is written, thus say the scriptures. Jesus used logic in reasoning with people. Turn to Mark chapter 3 and look at verse 35. On one occasion, Jesus family came to get him. They thought he was out of his mind. They thought that he was, um, he was embarrassing them. And they came to get him. And Jesus was in a house. He was healing and teaching. And the house was so crowded that his family couldn't find their way in. So they sent a messenger. And somebody came to Jesus and said, your whole family is waiting for you. And Jesus says in Mark 3, 35, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers and sisters? He looks around and he says, whoever does the will of God, the same as my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus is a man of impartiality. We need to hear that today. We have great respect for our families. We love our families and that's a good thing. But when it comes down to making a decision between the Lord and his people and my physical family, If there's ever any tension between the two, you know where the Lord wants us to side? 
You know where our loyalties, our ultimate loyalties really ought to lie? Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Jesus is a man of impartiality. Did he love Mary? Absolutely. Did he love his brothers and sisters? Absolutely. Did he care for them? Yes. But who's truly important to Jesus? It's about impartiality. It's not about who you're related to physically. It's about who you're related to spiritually. Look at Mark chapter 4. The Bible tells us that the apostles and Jesus are in a boat and there's a great storm, a great tempest that arises and the apostles fear for their lives. They, they don't know whether they're going to live or die, but Jesus is asleep on a pillow. And so they wake him up and they say, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? And Jesus wakes up and he looks at the wind and he says, peace be still. And immediately, it's like a F5 tornado, you know, all of a sudden it's just gone. It vanishes. There's, there's a great calm, the Bible says. The waves cease, the wind ceases, great calm. And the Bible tells us in Mark 4, 41, that the apostles look at each other. They're filled with great fear. They say to one another, who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. He's a man of power, Mark 4, 41. Jesus is powerful. He's more powerful than the storms. He's more powerful than the diseases that afflict us. He's more powerful than death itself. Who are you putting your faith in these days? Who do you trust these days? Where's your confidence these days? I want my confidence to be in the one who can still the storm. I want my confidence to be in the one who can overcome death. He's a man of power. Look at Mark chapter 5. A man with a legion of demons inside of him. In Mark chapter 5 verse 19, Jesus cast those demons out into a herd of swine. The swine run down the cliff and fall into the sea. And the man says, I want to come with you, Jesus. I'm so thankful that you have cleansed me from these demons. And Jesus says to him, Don't follow me right now. He says, I want you to go home and tell your friends how the Lord has been compassionate to you, the great things your Lord has done for you. Go home to your friends and talk to them about who he is. Who is Jesus? He's our dearest friend. What a friend we have in Jesus. It's a great song. He is the the friend that everybody wishes they could have. Because Jesus is loyal, he's faithful, he's patient, he's kind, he's wise, infinitely so. Jesus is our dearest friend. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves, and more importantly, he does for us what nobody else can do. You've never had a friend like Jesus. You never will have another friend like Jesus. When Mark presents Jesus to us, who does he say Jesus is? Look at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 and verse 50. Another storm, another group of fearful disciples. This time Jesus is not in the boat. Rather, he's walking to them on the water. And Jesus, when he climbs into the boat, the, again, waves cease. But Jesus, before he gets into the boat, it says in Mark 6, verse 50, take heart, be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus can walk on the troubled waters of your life and mine. Whatever's going on in your life, whatever troubles you are facing, whatever difficulties and circumstances you endure, Jesus walks on the troubled waters of our lives. He's a man of peace. It's fascinating that all of the New Testament epistles begin or end or both with the greeting and the salutation, grace and peace to you. And usually it says grace and peace to you in our Lord Jesus Christ or in God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. When we come to Jesus and we put our faith in him, there's great peace to be found. Incidentally, that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, one of the lines, my favorite line in that song, oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. He's a man of peace. Who's Jesus? We already used Mark seven thirty-seven. He's a man of majesty. He has done all things well. He makes the deaf to hear. He makes the mute to speak. Jesus has done all things well. He never did anything half-heartedly. And he never failed at anything he tried to do. 
You and I try all kinds of things. We have growing pains and learning experiences and difficulties, and it takes us a while to catch on, and we attempt to help somebody, and our attempts fall short. Not with Jesus. He's done all things well. He never saw a disease he couldn't fix, he couldn't heal. He never saw a dead person he couldn't raise. He's a man of majesty. Look at Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Who is Jesus? He's a man of proper values. He looks at you and he asks this question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? We need to stop and just sometimes appreciate the power and impact of those words. Because we get wrapped up in things that have nothing to do with salvation. They have nothing to do with eternity. And we give tons of time and energy and worry to those things. And Jesus, a man of proper values, says you've got to reorient your priorities, reorient your, your whole system of values and what's important in life. He's a man of proper values. What shall it profit if we gain the whole world and lose our soul? Who is Jesus? Look at Mark 9, verse 1. He's the king. Mark 9, verse 1, he's the king. He said 2,000 years ago, there are some of you standing here. He's talking to his audience. Some of you are standing here, he said, who will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Jesus believed the kingdom was going to come in his listeners' generation. There are people today that still say that the kingdom has not yet arrived. But Jesus is the king, and he knows when his kingdom is going to be established. You know what it was established? Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And you and I, when we become Christians, we become part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. In Colossians 1.13, the Bible tells us that God translates us out of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That's Colossians 1.13. Jesus is the king, and we can be part of his kingdom if we so desire. Mark 10, 45. If there's a rival to Mark 7, 37 for the key verse of Mark, it's Mark 10, 45. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus is presented in the gospel of Mark as a servant, the servant of all. I didn't come to get accolades. I didn't come for people to praise me and pat me on the back. I came to serve, to give my life a ransom for many. And then he calls you and me to follow him and to be like him in that regard and in every other way. Look at Mark chapter 11. Who is Jesus? Mark chapter 11, verse 9, he's a man of principle. My wife is teaching over in one of the Bible classes this morning, and she's teaching about the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's what Mark 11, verse 9 is all about, the triumphal entry. Jesus was riding on a donkey, and this was prophesied, and, and he was going to be the king of the Jews. And this was Old Testament prophecy. And so when the people saw that, they were laying down the palm branches in front of him and they were putting the, their, their cloaks on the road and they were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus knew what being the king really entailed. The crowds did not. The crowds thought we're just going to put a crown on his head and he's going to sit on a throne and we're going to have Solomon part two, even better. But Jesus knew that within a week he was going to be crucified. He's a man of principle. The claim and the praise of the crowds was not going to turn his head. It was not going to sway him from his mission. Like a laser beam, he was focused on the cross. Like a laser beam, he was focused on completing the work that God had given him to do, despite what the crowd said about him. Mark chapter 12 and verse 24 Jesus was not always what we would, you know, we would say nice. Um, I'm not sure I like that word in and of itself when it comes to what it means to be a Christian. Yes, we ought to be kind to people. Yes, we ought to be loving to people. But we need to appreciate about Jesus that Jesus could sternly rebuke people. Are you not greatly mistaken, not knowing the scriptures or the power of God? He asked his listeners, his questioners. You're greatly in error. You are wrong. You don't know the power of God. You don't know what the scriptures are teaching. You're not paying attention. Sternly rebuking people. That's not the only occasion when he did so. 
Mark chapter 13, verse 37, he's a man of vigilance. As he talks about the end, as he talks about the things that were going to happen after his departure, what I say to others, I say to you all, watch, be vigilant, stay alert. Remember that the Lord is going to return one day. Be on guard, be aware. He's a man of vigilance. In Mark 14, Mark presents Jesus as a man of discernment. Mark 14, verse 21, he's talking about Judas. Listen to his words. In Mark 14 and verse 21, he says, looking for it in my Bible here. <clears throat> the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. He's saying that about Judas. Would have been better if he had never been born than to do what he's about to do. Every time we do evil, every time we sin, and especially if we have the intention of persisting in sin, it might well be said of us, would have been better for that person if he'd not been born than to do what he's about to do. A man of discernment. Mark chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus was a man who could be bound. Didn't have to be. It's a profound thought. They could tie him up with ropes, and he was mightier than Samson. They could nail him to a cross, and yet he could have prayed to his father, and his father could have sent 12 legions of angels to deliver him. Jesus didn't have to do what he did. He allowed himself to be bound. He allowed his hands to be bound. He allowed his hands and feet to be nailed to that cross because he loves us. And then Mark chapter 16, verse 15, he's a man of compassion. With nail-scarred hands and feet, with a hole in his side from where the spear had pierced him, Jesus stood on that mountain in Galilee and he said, go preach the gospel to every creature. Even though he had been wounded, even though he had been killed by the hands of wicked men, even though all of us forsook him and all of us turned away from him, he still in compassion offers salvation, forgiveness, loyalty to him. He offers all those things. He's a man of compassion. You see these portraits of Jesus in these 16 chapters and you start to get a flavor of, a feel for how Mark feels about Jesus. He wants you to feel that same way. He wants you to have that same love and loyalty and picture of who the Savior is. Who Jesus is makes all the difference in how we live. Questions, comments that you'd like to offer? Whit? Yeah, Whit's pointing out the 12 legions. Jesus really only needed one angel. And really, technically, didn't even need that, did he? Matthew chapter 26, verse 53, 12 legions of angels would have been more than enough to get the job done. That's exactly right. Thank you very much for your time and your attention this morning. This is going to be, like I said, um, kind of a topical study in some ways. We're going to take the passages, but we're going to ask the question this quarter, how can I, how can you be more like Jesus? And so next week, if you want to, just kind of getting, getting ahead, you can read Mark chapter 1 with this in mind. How did Jesus relate to people? Was Jesus a recluse? Was he always off by himself? How did Jesus relate to people? Mark chapter one. We'll be answering that question in our next study next week. Thank you very much.